which may be confusing the uh, administrators a bit. But I've told them I'd talk about data breaches and password hashes, and I will. But I got more time than I expected, which is good because last week we finally got another attack working, which is a lot of fun. And so we're running around here with a lot of stuff, hopefully going to demonstrate it live. We'll see if we can make it work. Anyway, so um, I'm Sam Bound. I teach at City College, San Francisco, about which you're going to hear a lot more than any sensible institution would let you hear. Um, because I, for some reason, the people that hate me are public about it. They say what they want to say out loud, publish it in the newspaper. There's no secrets. Any sensible group, I'd have confidentiality agreements and everything else. But I don't have to worry about that because my enemies are proud of saying terrible things. So I, I don't have to conceal it or clean it up. So here's what happened. It started this year. The front page of the San Francisco Chronicle said, we had been breached. Worst data breach in history uh, or something to, uh, like that. We have. 10,000 machines, they're all infected with viruses. They've been infected for 10 years and we've done nothing about it. We're the stupidest people in the world. And so the phone started ringing and people asked me and people asked the people on the network security team and the network monitoring team at the college, what's happening? What should we do? And we all said, I have no idea. No, we didn't know anything. Our CTO just went and told the board of directors about this. The, uh, the board at the college, and then called the newspaper and went straight to the newspaper, didn't tell us anything. So people ask me, what about the virus? I said, well, I wish I knew something myself. Um, so here's the story, which was published in the newspaper and went all over the place. We got viruses. That's what viruses look like, in case you wonder. Um, <laughs> and the, the viruses crawl down the screen like this, and they take snapshots of your data, and they send it to the Russian business network. Um, and the teachers, like me, are ignoring the plain evidence of this and telling students that it's perfectly fine um, and there's nothing to worry about because we're all idiots. Um, and that's the story that went to the newspaper. Until USDN, which is also proud of their role in this, came in to save us. This is the company that found all these viruses, a local company around here. Um, they were hired as a security contractor by the college, by the CTO, and they convinced him that we were all full of these viruses and they were going to save us from the virus. But we couldn't find any. Um, this went around the world. This went to IEEE, it went overseas. This was a media sensation at the time because how could we have been infected for 10 years and done nothing about it and not even noticed? And on it goes. And the CTO called the newspaper before telling anybody and led the photographer through the lab to take pictures of our lab to put in the paper. So he apparently believed that this would result in something good for him, like him being seen as a hero or a whistleblower or some kind of beneficial figure in the world by going straight to the press with this all-important story. Um, so I, we worry about, often worry about outside attacks and often a little bit about insider threats, but now we have deluded insider threats. <laughs> what do you do when the people with high privileges in your networks are just completely insane? So I, I, now the question is, what was he thinking? And I've been spending a whole semester trying to figure this out, <laughs> heavily involved in committee meetings, which are probably better described as lynch mobs, trying to cope with this. And I still don't have an answer. But I knew it was false. And see, what's funny is we couldn't get a copy of the report at all. There was some report from this contractor, supposedly, which was the basis for all this. And we kept demanding it from the contractor and demanding it from the CTO. And we would get nothing about excuses and delays. And the point is, they figured that there was nobody around that would dare stand up against them when you cannot see the evidence and evaluate it. And I, this went on for a while, and I finally said, you know, it is my duty. I can afford to be wrong, and I know they're wrong. So I need to stand up against them even though I can't even see their evidence because that's how this game plays. They hide the evidence, and then nobody dares stand against them because I had my own independent reasons to believe this was garbage. We had replaced the hardware twice. Now, exactly how does the virus get through that? Um, we have antivirus, we have deep freeze, we have a firewall, our network is segmented in VLANs. We we're doing a lot better than most colleges. And there was a security audit by professionals years ago, and my students did a security audit of sorts, not a very in-depth one, as part of a CISSP class. And I know that there was nothing that terrible about the network. We found a couple of insecure protocols in use and the usual stuff to fix, but there was no red alert panic data breach on our campus. And also, an important thing to realize is this is not a breach. The CTO kept saying we have to send out letters to everyone that's ever been a student there for the last 10 years and go to the newspaper and everything else because we had a data breach. But if the student machines that they use in the labs have spyware on them, that's not a data breach. 
They use those machines at their own risk like they would at Kinko's. If they put in a credit card number and somebody steals it, that's not our property anyway. A data breach is when they get to our server and they take the data we saved about our students that we collected from them and there was no allegation that that had even happened. But the people involved thought this would be a data breach. And so um, here's the evidence. We couldn't get this report at all. Um, we finally got a partial report on January 31, but it said, see the appendices where they're supposed to be the packet captures and details to prove that any of this stuff is really on your network. And what happened, the technique here was to do network forensics. They put um, our traffic through some kind of monitoring device, connected it to Alien Vault, and then looked for suspicious traffic there. And anything that matched the signature proved we had certain viruses on the network, supposedly. But we were not allowed to see the raw packets or anything like that. And this, this report was marked proprietary and confidential. And they attempted for months to say that I couldn't see it and nobody at the campus was allowed to see it because it was proprietary and confidential. And the vice chancellor just said, wait a minute, we paid for it. How come we can't see it? And <laughs> anyway, later on, the CTO published it in the newspaper. That's what I'm showing you here. So that's what I mean about this whole secret stuff is not a problem for me. The people doing all this stuff publish everything about it in the newspaper. So I don't have to worry about uh, issues like that. So um, anyway, we tried to find this report. Um, but what the CTO found out that he was not a hero for going to the newspaper. So he denied talking to the newspaper and said, well, I talked to the FBI instead. And so, here's a question I use in my classes. Brand new students haven't been taught anything, at least by me, about security. I ask them this question. Somebody tells you you've got a whole bunch of viruses on your network, and you're a manager. Who do you talk to? Upper management? Your IT staff? Tell nobody. The FBI or the Chronicle? <laughs> and you know, completely uneducated people can immediately see that these two make no sense at all. You could argue for some of these. Why would you talk to the Chronicle? And why is talking to the FBI better? Somebody at the college should know about this nonsense. So we can nip it in the bud. So we finally had meeting after meeting screaming at this guy. He finally gave me a spreadsheet of the infected machines, claiming he had 2,000 infected machines with PII-related events, which means the port number and the IP address is somehow proves that we're infected by a PII-type virus. And by the way, 200 of these are our Unix DNS servers, which were detected with Windows viruses. So what's going on is when you get an email and you do a reverse DNS lookup, I was flagging that as evidence that you're in a botnet, I think. Although I've still never seen the raw packet captures to say exactly what train wreck happened to cause this nonsense. But we finally got a list from the CTO and I, he said there were 4,589 infected machines. So we went and looked at the 25 that were supposed to have Zeus and they had nothing. It's all garbage. One of them had a log in the McAfee saying Zeus came down and was stopped by the antivirus. But even that's enough to trigger this network forensic device to say we're infected. So this was fantastically stupid. There were no viruses at all. There's nothing to worry about. It's just a waste of everybody's time. So uh, the lynch mobs were getting rid of the CTO with great difficulty. And eventually, um, he was removed from the campus by the police. But he, put, he pub put the entire report in the newspaper. And he published a long list explaining how none of this is his fault. There's a gang, the people going to go to his grave saying there are viruses on the network. There's a huge conspiracy. The chancellor, the network administrator, uh, the legal counsel, and me are all in a secret conspiracy to cause this. And I'm no good because uh, Abhaxis hacked the college about a year ago, or pretended to. He made a fake hack to try to get me fired, which was proven false at the time. But somehow it's true again when it's time to put it in the newspaper. Anyway, um, so that's what happened there. He finally got removed from the campus, shoved off and told he can't set foot on any of our properties again without explicit permission from the chancellor, which is a very good idea, because high privilege insiders that are out of their mind is bad. Anyway, so that, that's our fake breach. Uh, now, let's talk, a, let's talk about a real breach. Um, so if you have a real SQL injection like this, where you've got an apostrophe in the URL and you get a SQL uh, syntax error, then as you know, you're vulnerable for a real attack here. A lot of these web pages had it. And so uh, these guys went and used, um, this hacking group went and used uh, SQL map to attack them. And in some of their dumps, they left the commands they used in SQL map, which is kind of friendly of them. Um, so this is Team Ghost Shell. In August of this year, they went and attacked a whole bunch of companies and dumped all the data. And I thought it was a good chance to look at password security. So here's their political explanation of why they're doing it or something, which I don't care much about. Here's the people they hacked. This CIA services is not the CIA I was thinking of. 
This is like a housing authority someplace in some small town. Huh? So here's the categories of password storage. This is beyond belief. This is like so bad, I don't think I have polite words for it. Um, so these guys have got, pat this is Buchanan bond, word, bond exchange, and the passwords are stored in plain text, and most of them are Buchanan bond one. So they're even all the same. And that, you'll see more of this. Here's passwords all stored in plain text for this company, Region Associate, a law company, and almost all of them are the same. K-Law, obviously there's a default, and nobody ever even changed the default. Um, and here's Sparkland, a company that sells car parts, and all the passwords are just Sparkland. So that's, that's kind of worse than I would imagine. Um, anyway, uh, here's B Forward, and so these guys got hacked. Now they, this is a breach. These is customer data, thousands of them, and they've dumped out the names of these people and their addresses. That's a breach. Now, if this was America, you'd have to go through breach notification and all that jazz. I don't know if these people will have to do it wherever they are. Um, so more plain text passwords here. At least they're not all the same, but they're like four letters and such, so that's not terribly good. The next thing, there's people that decide they're going to obfuscate the passwords <laughs> with base 64. So that's what this nonsense is, right? And they tell you, in case you're concerned, that they employ commercially reasonable security methods. <laughs> so apparently that is commercially reasonable. And so obviously you can just go online and reverse those. That's nothing but that. So the next thing is MD5 or SHA-1. This is real hashing. So here's um, the dump from MIT. Uh, not the main MIT website, but uh, one of the subsidiary websites at MIT. Here's all their MD5s, and this one, even the people that dumped it were able to crack that and turn that into Hiawatha, and I was able to just crack any of it by just using an online tool. You know, it, reversing an MD5 hash is relatively simple. You cannot do it in all cases, but you can do it if the password is in any list of known passwords by just doing a reverse lookup. Um, so MIT, by the way, has a very good form to report security incidents, and I did. I don't know if they did anything about it, but at least there's a form to use. Um, so MySQL 323 is another password hash. Uh, uh, you'll see places, and you can crack that one with Kane. Um, and SHA-1 is another one commonly used, um, which is hardly any better than MD5, just a little bit. You can crack those online, too. And as you see, this is not an enormously obvious password, Ben246907, you know, but that cracks with a, a free online password cracker. I don't even need GPUs and Hashcat or any of that fancy stuff. Um, and here's MySQL 5. They've got their own special format. And WordPress has their format with a P in it. And the interesting thing is, um, here's these things I think are Shaw ones, and he cracked Chicken Marine and Chicken 2. But uh, the last one's easily cracked with an online tool as well. So those are password hashes. So why bother hashing your passwords if they're that easy to crack? And um, here's the CIA with their breach. So let's talk about why this is a bad idea. Um, this is a nice article listing all the types of hashes and salts that are used in common software. There's only about six or seven typical password hashes used. And um, they are all worthless because they're all designed modern. You've got to use Bcrypt or some similar routine. Uh, the problem is these passwords are designed to crack fast. That's the point here is what I'm looking for. These, these hash functions are designed to be fast, so you can calculate the SHA-1 hash of a 10 gigabyte file without waiting forever, and that's not what you want for passwords. You want it to be slow. So um, you've got to use one of these, bcrypt is one, and there are other routines that just do many, many, many reps of hashes, like 5,000 SHA-1s, or 5,000 SHA-512s like this MacBook Air does. And then it takes a long time to calculate each hash, like 50 milliseconds, which is no problem for me to log in, but it makes it essentially impossible to make those huge reverse dictionaries that you need to crack these passwords. Everybody should be doing that, and nobody is, as far as I know. But the only company I know that is doing this is Cloudflare. By the way, and I guess we're in the kind of place I can ask this, how many people, your company's actually using a proper password hash like bcrypt? One, two, two. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's, I'm glad some people are doing it. Of course, you, they probably wouldn't all tell me if they were doing it. But anyway, it is a shame if you're using the SHA-1 or MD5 or any normal hash routine for this, because they're not intended for password storage, and it's very much wasting your time. And since you're like